It is so good to be back here tonight with y'all and just to be in God's Word together. It has been a lovely and wonderful Christmas, but I am so ready to be back in the Word with all of you all. It's, I miss it so much. It's, it's like I told my daughter, I think my soul is starving a little. I mean, I'm still at home. I'm still doing things. It's not like I'm alone in it, but it's just something about being with you here on Wednesday nights that is just so important for me. So I'm so grateful to be back. If you're new to us this season, if you just haven't been for whatever reason, we would like to give you one of these tonight. This is a journal that has the book of Mark in it, and you can use it to keep notes, to read it yourself beforehand. There's a page of print, which is the Bible text, and a page for you to write on. Um, so you can either track your notes in here that, of what Karen writes, or you can read it ahead. We certainly encourage that. And then make your own notes and then enjoy what Karen says and add to what you wrote, what you find in what she says. I've been thinking about coming back in Christmas and, you know, we spend Christmas talking about Jesus, of course, because it's the birth of Jesus and the fact that Jesus is God, of course. And I was, I read this this week. And it, um, it's on my Facebook, but for those of you who don't have my Facebook, <laughs> um, I wanted to read it to you. It's a Timothy Keller quote, if you're familiar with him. The only person who dares wake up a king at 3 a.m. for a drink of water is a child. We have that kind of access. The Jesus that we're talking about here, that we're learning about in Mark, the Jesus that we celebrated in December, we have that kind of access. We are beloved children of a king. We have access. When you hear about Jesus and you discover things about who he is and what he wants for you, just remember that is open there for you, open arms waiting for you to come and take it. None of this is, I'm not good enough. I didn't do it right. None of it. It's all there for you. You have that kind of access. And I just find that to be, that was so compelling to me. It just spoke to my spirit about how I judge myself and hold myself back sometimes from things God wants me to walk into. Mm -hmm. So I just really encourage you to remember as we study and learn and as you become closer and closer to Jesus, he wants it all for you. Mm -hmm. You don't have to hold yourself back. Um, let's pray and get started. Oh, by the way, Sandy is in uh, San Diego with her, her grandchild and her son and his family and misses y'all desperately and uh, dropped us a note to say thank you and hello, but she will be back with us next week. Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for your word that speaks to our hearts. Thank you for who you are, because that's what your word just tells us. It tells us who you are. And thank you that you, in all that you are, chose to love us. Father, as we read your word, as we hear from Karen tonight, can you stir our hearts, draw us to you, and help us just to love you a little bit more and a little bit more, and to change, to be more and more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. That might be too loud. Yeah, I think okay. it's too loud. Hold, please. <laughs> <laughs> I sound like I'm in a drum. <laughs> a little bit better. Is this better? 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 Okay, well, welcome back, everybody. If you are new or just you know, missed some time last time, I'm going to kind of bring you up. You forgot over Christmas where we are. We are in the study of Gospel of Mark. Um, we are about halfway through at this point, a little over halfway through. And if you remember, just kind of bring you up from last time, is that chap in chapter one, and, um, we uh, learned a little bit, well, in, 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 the, in Acts, we learned a little bit about Mark, and what we know about him as, a, as the writer is he's not a disciple. He is not a disciple, he's not one of the 12, but he was a cousin of Barnabas. He was a uh, companion of Paul for a time. And uh, he was a servant in the early church, and he 
most likely got his substance of his book, of course, from the Holy Spirit, but he was a companion of one who did follow Jesus personally, and that's Peter. And so he got a lot of what he learned, most likely, from talking with him. And Mark's gospel was written around 55 to 65 AD. Now, why is that important? Uh, because it places it as being written only a couple of decades after uh, Jesus' death, crucifixion, um, his burial, and his ascension. And so that's important because the people who knew Jesus and who, who got the, the, the letter were still alive when Jesus lived, right? Now, for example, if it, we're talking about today, it, what if we were in a history class here and I stood up here and I was talking about John F. Kennedy and I said to you who were in the room here, I said, you know what? John F. Kennedy didn't die from a bullet in Dallas in a convertible. He was stabbed to death in his bed in Washington, D.C. And there would be a lot of uproar here going, uh, 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 uh. That's not right. I remember that. I was alive when that happened. And the same thing is true back then. At the time of Mark's writing of his letter, he was talking about a lot of things that people remembered. People were alive that. And they go, okay, you know, I knew Bartimaeus. I knew when he was blind. I knew Jairus and his daughter. I, uh, um, I knew that James and John used to have a fishing business. I remember all of that. So that gives strength to what Mark wrote. If he was writing lies or making up things, then people would go, uh, 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 no, that's not right. So it was that it came out so close to the actual events is really important. And um, it was it's important to remember that. So, and if you remember, we talked about a little bit at the beginning last time that Mark wrote to a Roman audience. He was not writing to Jewish people. He was writing to people who were Gentiles. And he gives us the purpose of his letter right there in uh, the first verse of the first chapter where he tells us that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And we spent a whole lot of time in the very first lesson going through each one of these words uh, and uh, to see that this verse is the overarching theme of the entire Book. It is the thesis statement, if you remember that from English class back in high school, uh, is the point of everything else he writes. So every story we read, every interaction he has, every miracle that happens comes under the heading of the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so up until this point, we've seen how emphatic Mark has been about recording the actions of Jesus as we go along here and that point to him as the divine son of God. Uh, he's more than some, uh, Mark helps us understand that he's more than somebody who has good things to say. He's more than a good example. Um, he is somebody who, who, who is the divine incarnate Son of God, which speaks really directly to what we face today in our world, right? For people who are increasingly want to accept Jesus the good man, Jesus the good role model, Jesus the moral teacher, but want to downplay his divinity. Uh, divinity. But the God, in the Gospel of Mark, uniquely of all the other Gospels, he puts way less emphasis on Jesus' teaching, not that it's not important, but he's pointing us again and again and again back to who Jesus really is and what his character really is. And it reminds us that we can't take Jesus' teaching without also realizing and accepting and surrendering to Jesus as the Son of God. Spent a lot of time last fall looking at wonderful miracles, and we saw over and over and over how clearly Jesus laid hold to his divinity, and he forgave sin, he for healed diseases, he claimed authority more supreme than uh, Moses or his disciple uh, or, or the prophets, and he said clearly, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. And the teachers of the law, they knew exactly what he was saying. There was no confusion about what, uh, what they were understanding him to say because that's why we see all the way back in chapter 3 that they began to conspire with their enemies, the Herodians, how they might kill Jesus. And so um, 
<laughs> that brings us up, kind of. This, I look, take a look at this timeline. If you have one of these from last fall, if not, there's some more on the back there. But this timeline just helps us give an overview of the, the ministry and life of Jesus, the three years he was teaching. And the great part here is all what is covered in uh, the Gospel of, of Mark. And you'll see that um, we are now, if you look around here at the bottom, go all the way up to... Right here, chapter 10, verse 1, all the way over to the very end of Jesus' ministry. And we're about to enter into the last week of Jesus' life on earth. And if you're concerned, hey, I missed all this up that, that led up to here, don't worry. Videos are online. You can go watch them if you want to. Or if you can't, you don't have time to catch up, don't worry. There is a lot to cover between now and chapter 16 when we wrap up in May. And so today we're going to cover chapter 10, verses 17 to 31, which is what is often referred to as the story of the rich young ruler. And as I did uh, last semester, um, I like to give names to people who don't have names in the Bible. And if you were here before, you remember that this came about when I was co-teaching with another lady uh, back years and years ago. And we were doing a, a lesson on, uh, or a series on nameless women of the Bible and she didn't like that they didn't have names, so started making up names. And the names that she made up, and we did for the rest of the series, have something to do and tell us something about the character and situation of the people in the story. And so, uh, remember, we met Diablo last semester, and he's the man who um, was filled with demons. And Diablo means uh, devil in Spanish, so you see demons, devil, that's how it goes. And we met Scarlet, the woman with the issue of blood, where red blood red scarlet and we met uh, Tyra the lady from Tyre and Sidon so today you might have already guessed we're gonna meet the rich young ruler and his name is Richard <laughs> right rich Richard got it okay so, this is uh, this passage in uh, about this man is really often taught only in conjunction with a message specifically about money or materialism or too much emphasis on wealth, those kinds of things. Certainly one of the lessons that you can take out of this. But I think what, at what Jesus is getting at in this story is way deeper than that. Way deeper because we sometimes want to distance ourselves from this because we go, well, I don't have a lot of money and that's not an issue with me, so I don't have to listen to this. But he's dealing with a subject in this, in here, that I think is an issue for all of us, and that is the issue of sacrifice. Um, and so I want to kind of get at this. We'll get to the, the details and the verses in a minute, but let me kind of back up and give you a little background on sacrifice as it meant, is meant in terms of the Bible. So in the Old Testament, the law was the written code of how people were supposed to interact with each other and with God himself. And a significant portions of Leviticus, uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy is given to regulations and details about how to make a proper sacrifice. Now, there was a lot of things that you were supposed to bring as a sacrifice. Sometimes it was a drink offering. Sometimes it was grain offering. But a lot of it was animal sacrifice. And it could be doves or bulls or sheep, goats, those kinds of things. But when you're talking about a sin offering, God gave very, very, very specific instructions on how, what kind, and when to bring an animal to the temple. And chief among the requirements for a sin offering was that the animal must present a male without defect. And we know from where we stand in the New Testament that that was really important because it foreshadowed the spotless Lamb of God that was going to take away the sins of the world. So, But that was really, really important. And in Leviticus chapter 22, in this one short paragraph here, uh, God reiterates three times that it should be perfect, flawless, and without defect. And then it goes on after this into long detail about what that really means uh, without looking at all the little details and everything. But that's it. He's saying it's be healthy, strong, and flawless. Over and over and over again, you see that 
in this passage and a lot scattered all through the law. Now, centuries later, in the book of Malachi, the prophet chastised the Israelites way forward in time from here, ignore, because they were ignoring that stipulation. And instead, they were bringing injured, crippled, diseased animals and offering them as sacrifice. And he said they're cursed for doing that. If you have a spotless animal and you bring a diseased animal to God um, instead. And so the people were doing exactly opposite of what the known law required. Now, the Levites and the teachers of the law during that time, they studied the law, they copied the law, they looked at the law, they read the law. So their choice to disobey wasn't due to a misunderstanding or a lack of knowledge. They knew exactly what was supposed to happen. And so what they were doing at this time was a deliberate decision based on, based on something very, very basic. They disobeyed because healthy animals were more valuable to them than the sick ones. Sick ones. It's logical, right? A strong oxen could be used for pack animals or to bring, or for farming. Healthy sheep could be sold for uh, sold or used for wood or meat. And um, flawless animals could be used for breeding. Or and and they didn't need the special attention that weak or sick ones required. So when God said, "Bring healthy and pure animals," He was not just saying, "Honor me by obeying." He was asking for them to give something of value to him, often something of great value. And this is what sacrifice is all about. Voluntarily giving up something that is of great value to us. And this happened all the time through scriptures. This was the God's call to people to make a sacrifice that meant something, that was weighty, that was important. And uh, think about Abraham, right? Remember the story of Abraham? God literally asked him to sacrifice his son, the one born to him in his old age. Remember Genesis 22, he says, take your son, your only son, Isaac. And then God defines, he says, that one you love and take him to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountain, mountains that I tell you about. And this must have been an agonizing struggle for Abraham to obey this command. It must have been overwhelming. But the scripture recounts that, uh, that Abraham got up early the next morning, and, and in his unwavering commitment to God, he promptly journeyed to where God led him and then did what God asked. Now, what was God asking Abraham to sacrifice certainly a son yes but also his future his lineage and everything that was integral to this old man you know what he saw as how his future and his family would go forward but yeah he did it and the uh, you might know fast forward to the story of elijah you remember there was a three-year drought and um there was this we meet this uh widow of zarephath and she is um we, when we meet her, she's gathering together a few sticks to make a, her last cake of bread because she doesn't have any more food, no way to get it. There's no crops or grain anymore after three years. Um, and she says to herself, I'm going to make this last cake of bread for my son and me, and then we're going to die. We don't have anything else. And, and sh here Elijah shows up, and he said, looks at her and says, hey, can you make me a loaf of bread instead? And, um, and she does it. And so what she's sacrificing is not only her life, she thinks, and the life of her son. Now we know the rest of the story that um, that didn't happen, but at the time she doesn't know that, that, that he's not gonna eat her last meal and not have anything else. And then we spend a whole semester last year, year ago, looking at Esther, how she sacrificed over and over and over again for the protection of God's people and risked her life more than once to do that. And then we think about the story of Jonah. It's also a, a story of sacrifice. We don't often think about it like that because he was a prophet of God. And God called him to preach to a, some evil and pagan people in the city of Nineveh. And if you've ever studied anything about Nineveh, these were appalling people. And what they were doing was just 
horrible. And uh, so God calls him, says, go preach to them, take the good news to them, make a sacrifice of your prejudice against them, and go do what I called you. And Jonah says, no. But God kind of insists. He kind of puts the pressure on him. We know the story of the boat ride and the, and the big fish and being vomited up onto the land by the fish. So that's going to get your attention, right? <laughs> but uh, so uh, Jonah does relent and he does go and preach, but he never really gives up his, sacrifice, his, his prejudice against those people. And so the story, God's will is done, but it's kind of a mess as when it comes to Jonah. And, but chiefly because he won't give up the sacrifice that God, not fully, the sacrifice that God calls him to make. So that's just a few examples in the Old Testament. There's a lot more, but if we come up to the Gospel of Mark for the sake of time, we look at the disciples. Jesus confronted Peter, James, and John right at the beginning of the Gospel of, of, of Mark with a bold challenge. He says, come, follow me. And it was a simple re request. But consenting required a lot more than just leaving a few fish behind. He was asking them to, to give up their careers, their families, their futures. Jesus asked for them to leave it all behind. And the funny thing is, is that they did it. They did it. And they did it right there in the middle of the day, not with a two-week notice, not going home to pack a suitcase, not talking it over with the wife, tying up loose is there was nothing else they just dropped it all walked away and followed him and um and gave up everything that they had worked their entire lives to build at that point and then we're up to our passage today richard was a guy who was really interested in spiritual things he was concerned about pleasing god he was concerned about eternal life and uh and he ran up to jesus and this man insisted that he uh, he had followed the law all his life. And he says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him, that's Richard, and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. Now, some people look at this passage specifically, and they point to this as evidence that Jesus wasn't God, because they, they read this and say, here Jesus is, and say, is distancing himself from God, saying, oh, oh, no one is good but God. God, I'm not good either. I'm not God. I'm not good. That's not what, that's the, what that is saying there. Uh, he is actually highlighting his divinity in these statements here. He was, uh, he was saying, and this man was coming up to him and saying, you know, you look, you have a lot of good things to say. I recognize that you're good. Uh, but Jesus was drawing him, trying to draw him out with his response here to help him see and make the connection between his goodness and godness. Because there's what Paul tells us later on in Romans is that there is no one good but God. And this is so important in a, a day when you hear people point to unbelievers and people of other religions and say, I can't understand and I can't believe in a God who would send good people to hell. Because I know my neighbor, my boyfriend, my wife, my boss, whatever, they are, they are good people. They do good things and they are such a good people that I can't believe that God would send them to hell. But the truth is they're not good. They're not. The Bible says no one is good except God alone. Now, people may do some good things on the outside, but where it counts on the inside and what God looks at is not good apart from a relationship to him. That's the truth. Any goodness that we ever have, any true goodness, is a gift of the Spirit that comes from God himself through a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the only way we ever have anything good in us. Remember uh, the vine and the branches from John chapter 15? Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing, not anything. So goodness is an attribute that belongs to God alone. And so this man recognized that Jesus was good. He saw the goodness in Jesus, but he failed to take the next logical step of what he said that and to see that he, because he's good, 
He must be God. And that's really important. Um, and so Jesus goes on in this interaction with the, the rich man, young ruler and says, You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Now, first, is Jesus saying the way that we, we get eternal life is by keeping the law and doing good things? No, nope. that's not what he's saying here at all. What he's doing here is leading this guy who kind of answered in a really prodigal way, right? I mean, who would say that I've kept all of the law since I was a boy? I mean, how can you do that? Um, but he, this guy thinks that he's lived up to the law. And he's trying, Jesus is trying to lead him to see him, to help him see how far from that he really is. So Jesus lists six of the Ten Commandments right here. And when he says, I've kept them all my life, Jesus touches on the one thing that proved the opposite. Let's look. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lacked, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away because he had great wealth. And the man here was not willing to follow the Lord if it meant he had to give up his money, right? Thus, the man was breaking the very first commandment and the most important one. You shall have no other gods before me. So he, 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 had, he said he kept all these things, but his wealth had been become a god and he loved it more than he loved god so he broke the first one and you know what the law says you break one you break all of them so one of the main reasons and applying this to us is that god asked us to sacrifice something is that he intends to purify us in this story with richard god asked for him to let go of his wealth because it was in the way he, he wanted to be spiritually in tune. He wanted to know how to follow God. He wanted eternal life, but his materialism was ultimately more important than his relationship with the Lord. And this is probably the case for us more than realize. And I'm not just talking about money here. Because just about anything can be, become a potential stumbling block to deeper trust in God. Uh, and that's friends, relationships, money, possessions, Dreams, goals, habits, your kids. It can even be pursuing knowledge. Biblical knowledge can even get in the way if we want that more than we want to know who God is. And where our affection for anyone or anything becomes stronger than our affection for God, then he's ultimately going to ask us to lay it on the altar. But God doesn't want us to just modify our outward behavior, right? He's after something very much different deeper than that and he's after dealing with us those inner attachments that we have now make sure you hear me on this i am not saying that dealing with the outside doesn't matter that is chiefly important especially when you're dealing with situations of overt sin right it is critically important and that's often the first step to cut loose with those things that we're doing, we're saying, we're having, having we're coveting, um, that, that, be, that helps us start with the sacrifice to deal with and, and make a commitment to change your actions. But for sacrifice to be thorough, the inner attachments have to be dealt with at, as well. Because if you don't work through those hidden longings that are on the inside, then you still have hold of whatever it is and by consequence, it still has hold of you. And eventually, you will find a way to maneuver back to whatever you really want that's inside when you think nobody's looking. And that's why sometimes our viewing history on media devices or our thought life or our internal conversations with ourselves looks really different than our Sunday morning selves. That's because uh, the sacrifice that God asks us to make in obedience to him isn't complete. And we hang on to things uh, because, you know, after all, nobody's watching. Nobody's here when I'm doing that. And so does it really matter at all? And we hang on and we hang on and we hang on to things that God asks us to give up. And this is why it explains the struggle we have oftentimes with spiritual growth, and really knowing God more deeply. We won't deal with the things that he's putting his finger on. 
And so releasing the emotional attachments is the key to victory over sin, moving on with God, and finding the life that God has for you. And we can really struggle at this part of the equation. That's because at the deepest levels, what we're really de dealing with is fear. We're afraid if we give up the thing he's asking for, uh, that he's not going to be on our side. We're going to lose something. We're not going to have the things that we think are so important to us. And that brings us, uh, we talked about Isaiah 12 too last fall, but it's good to point out again. This is the equation for dealing with a fear. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. You see that? What happens How where you deal with fear, the solution to fear? I will trust and not be be afraid there's a connection there and once we're sure that we can trust God then we can rest in his ability to save us now don't think of salvation as the dying go to heaven kind of salvation think about it as being preserved in and through destruction danger or difficulty that's what he's talking about here and so preservation is exactly what God wants to do for us it's what Jesus had in mind for this man when he talked to him. And we see this when he says um, in Mark 10, 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. This is my favorite part of the story. And I think that's important that he included that, there, that, that in this. Jesus wasn't mad at Richard. He wasn't angry at him. He loved him. He looked at him. He knew what was in the way of finding what this man was searching for. How can I have eternal life? How can I follow God more closely? How can I know him? He knew that his wealth was in the way. And he loved him and was drawing him toward what he really wants. And that's how he interacts with us, too, uh, when he asks us to lay down our desires. He loves us. He knows what's best for us. But we are like the rich young ruler here when we don't trust him. And let me remind you that you are not going to trust him if you don't know it. You are not going to trust somebody with something precious and valuable to you if you don't know them. I mean, think about your social security number You're not, or your bank routing numbers, right? You're not going to give those to a stranger because you don't trust what they're going to do. But you might give it to somebody who you dearly love, like your husband or a child that you trust or a family member. Because you know that you can trust them with that because they're not going to do you wrong. And this is the same relationship with God. When we know him, we know his intentions for us. We trust him with those things, those precious things that he asks us to lay down. And so Jesus says right here at the end of this passage that we're studying today, he tell, reminds us that we can, we can trust him with this. He says, I tell you the truth, no one who has left home, brothers, sisters, mother, father, children, or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times much, both now and in the age to come. And he's saying, you can trust me with the stuff I ask you to give up. And, and you know, uh, he knows you. He has got you. You can trust him, but that requires that we know him too. Once again, you don't trust somebody you don't know. And we don't have to wonder what his intentions are toward us because the Bible is a written record of that, right? I mean, of how God, and it's how God responds to those who trust him. And there's not one example anywhere in all of scripture about somebody who gave him the sacrifice he asked for that he didn't honor and bless. Now, they didn't always get everything that they wanted exactly the way they wanted, but he profited them spiritually. He raised them up. He honored them. That's what the Bible says. And, uh, and this is what this passage tells us. He is faithful always. And I remind you that our ability to emotionally let go of things that are dear to us is directly proportional to how much we know and trust God. Every time. So, What's at stake in all of this? Many of you uh, know the words of Jeremiah 29, 11. That's a coffee cup verse, like a pastor I said, always says. You know, it's like we really like that verse, but we don't really know what comes before and after. We don't have time to read all of Jeremiah 29, but I challenge you to go back and read the whole chapter. There's a lot of hard, uh, terrible things, difficult situations that come before this verse. But that's the point, that in the middle of that, even when it looks crazy, when it looks like it's not going right, he comes back and says, don't look at those things and think I'm trying to hurt you. 
I know the plans I have for you, even in the middle of hard stuff, he says. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, and to give you hope and a future. Uh, so sometimes we have this misguided conclusion that God asks us to give up things because he's trying to keep something from us. I mean, haven't you sometimes prayed a prayer that kind of sounded like this? Please, God, don't take that from me. Please don't take him from me. Please don't take her from me. I mean, it sounds like that. And the implication of praying like that is we think we know what's good for us better than God does. But our Heavenly Father is not out to harm or deprive us. His intention is to prosper us, not the temporary prosperity of wealth or ease that we default go to. God is mainly interested in profiting us where it matters, on the inside, spiritually speaking. And when he asks to get us to give up something, it's ultimately for our benefit. And to resist him is to struggle against God's attempt to preserve us and to give us something more marvelous than we can imagine. Every single one of us has an example of prayers we've prayed 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago that we come up to today and go, I am so glad you did not give me the answer to that, right? <laughs> I mean, I know I have prayed some, oh, <laughs> I'm glad that didn't happen, prayers. But, you know, and, but we can't apply that to now. When we don't get what we want or he's asking us to give up something dear to us, we think it's, it's more valuable. And what the main issue is for us is that we think the value is in what we're clutching. We zero in on a relationship, a possession, a dream, a habit, and we plead for God not to take it. But the issue is not your career, it's not your health, it's not that dating relationship, it's not your money or a friendship or a dream or your future. It's not any of those things that make us go, oh God, please don't. These are points of spiritual intersection that if we respond correctly, we gain an unmistakable realization that God is real he loves us with an overwhelming love. And at these points, God desires to reveal himself in unimaginable ways to us, not previously known, that he specifically is faithful and trustworthy. That's what these are, spiritual intersections. And to say no is to miss an encounter with God that may define the rest of your life. Think about Abraham that we talked about. Do you think he knew what was really on the line when he was standing on that mountain with Isaac? Do you think he had any idea of how pivotal of an event that really was? I mean, from his perspective, he's standing there all, up, all, all alone, right? He's up on a mountain out in the middle of nowhere. There's nobody around. The servants are three days away. And he's like, um, okay, nobody's present. He had no idea that anybody would know what went on in that moment at all. Could he have understood right there what, that what was happening in this solitary moment was part of God's big plan to show the rest of the world what redemption was all about? He had no idea. No way to grasp the significance of what he was really doing. And then there's the disciples. Did they know what was really on the line when he said, put the fish and the nets down and come follow me? They had no idea what was going on. No, no idea what, to, you know, they just heard rumors about Jesus. They didn't really know yet what was going on. Could they have fathomed that people would be talking about them, drawing strength from their writings, or that they were pivotal in changing the entire world in that moment? No way. No way they understood. Ever, ever wondered what was on the line for the rich young ruler? What could his life have been if he had laid down his entire wealth and walked away? Jesus looked at him and said, follow me. It's the same words he said to Peter, James, and John. Presumably, Richard went back to his house, counted his money, lived a comfortable life, and he died thought that he had held on to the thing 
of greatest value. But in the moment, he turned his back on discovering exactly who Jesus was and finding the real riches that would have eternally satisfied him. He never gave God the chance to show him the real impact of his life. Could, it was a bad decision. Bad decision that based solely on valuing temporary things that count for zero in eternity. Most of us really don't compare ourselves to Richard because we really think that this is a story about greed, about money, about wealth. And, but it's not about dollars and cents primarily. It's about saying yes when Jesus is pointing out something in the way of a deeper relationship with him. And any time we hold back when God says give it up and lay it down, we're just like him. We're making the same mistake. So we all really know what was in the balance for Richard. Could have been another disciple, maybe. Privileged to follow Jesus around for the next few months and witness the crucifixion and the resurrection. He could have been instrumental, maybe, in bringing others into the kingdom by this grand display of giving away everything to follow Jesus. He could have been a leader in the early church. We just don't know what could have happened. And the truth is, you don't know either. You don't know what hangs in the balance of the decisions that you make when God says give up things. You don't. That's because we end up looking at the wrong things, right? You become fixated on what you're clutching in this hand and not on the God who says to open it. And really, you have no idea what hangs in the balance. You don't. No understanding of what God wants to do in and through you or what is on the other side of saying yes to God. You have no grasp of really what is on the line in the moments when he asks us to put things down. And the truth is, your greatest potential for growth, deeper faith, lies not in how many Bible studies you go to or how many times you go to church or witness or give, but lies in what you do when God asks you to make a total sacrifice of something of intense value. And the key to open your hand, like we said before, is knowing ultimately it's not about the thing or the person or the dream or the goal, but it's about your faith and trust in who God is. And he's primarily after a deeper relationship with you. And he will always, always honor our expressions of faith in him. Amen? Amen. God, we just thank you that you are kind and gracious and patient with us. And you know the struggles that are deep in our heart um, when you ask us to do hard things. And God, help us know that we can trust you with any and everything. And if you ask us to give something up, it's for a reason, even if we can't see what it is. God, by your Holy Spirit, give us the faith to trust you. Draw us to your word where we can understand who you are and learn about how you are faithful and trustworthy in all things. And we pray that in this study uh, tonight and going forward that we would realize who your son is, that he is the divine son of God, and that he has all power and able to sustain us through all things. And we pray in his mighty name. Amen.